Now we'll move into a time of hearing the Lord speak to us again through His Word. And uh, I'm going to invite us to say a prayer together as we approach God's Word. You'll see it there in your bulletins and probably up on the screen. Say this together as we come to the Word. Send your Spirit among us, O God, as we meditate on the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Prepare our minds to hear your word. Move our hearts to accept what we hear. Purify our will to obey in joy and faith. This we pray through Christ our Savior. Amen. We're going to be in Luke chapter 4, verses 1 through 15 again this morning. And I want to invite Charlie Sabalepsi forwards to read for us. Again, it's going to be in Luke 4, 1 through 15. And I've got it right up here for you, John. Thank you. Good morning. And Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by the devil. And he ate nothing during those days. And when they were ended, he was hungry. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command this stone to become bread. And Jesus answered him, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone. And the devil took him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And he said to him, To you I will give all this authority and the glory, for it has been delivered to me, and I will give it to whom I will. If you then will worship me, it will all be yours. And Jesus answered him, It is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. And he took him to Jerusalem, and sent him on a pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down for here, from here, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you to guard you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered him, It is said, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. And when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him until an opportune time. The grass withers and the flowers fade. Say that with some enthusiasm, folks. <laughs> the word of our God will stand forever. Amen. Can you get out the pillows or what? Come on. <clears throat> well, as you know, we've been in this passage here in Luke for a number of weeks. We've been looking at various aspects of Jesus' time in the wilderness. And We've talked a bit about how the wilderness in the Bible is both a reality and metaphor, how it's both a place and an experience. Last week we looked at doing battle using the Word of God in the wilderness. So this morning we're going to focus on worship in the wilderness, this idea of being in the wilderness and being able, being in a position to truly worship the Lord, even despite our circumstances, whatever they might be. And to introduce the sermon today, I would like to play a short video clip of Shane Bernard and Shane Everett, who are musicians, talking about the inspiration for their song, Though You Slay Me. If you've never heard the song, it is absolutely beautiful. I'd encourage you to take a moment and write that down and find it on YouTube sometime. It's called Though You Slay Me. And so I'm going to invite Felicia to pull up that video and we'll watch it. It's four or five minutes or so, but it's going to really set up what I feel like the Lord is desiring for us to hear this morning. Really well, so. We were on tour. I woke up on our bus with a text message from my mom um, that said your dad had a heart attack in the night in the hospital. Um, he was alive but not doing good. I flew, actually didn't even say anything. To, I didn't really have a whole lot of cognitive thoughts. Um, got on an airplane, flew home. And over the course of 24 hours, just, you know, poured out our hearts. 
heart to the Lord. And my mom, who grew up this, uh, you know, in a Catholic family, um, recently at that time converted to uh, to be a believer. Um, and all cried in a way, and she was just crying out. I, I stayed with her in a hotel room. Crying out for for my dad's life, and and uh, you know we were there the next day. We we're all in this little room. My dad was he looked perfectly fine. Uh, he was on my life support. I mean he had a hemorrhage in his brain, and so that uh, he had fallen asleep uh, you know, before I even got there. And uh, at some point, the doctor came in and you know looked at my mom and said. started pounding on his chest and uh, completely lost. I mean, couldn't stand and hyperventilating. I just, I, I grabbed her this tiny little, you know, lady just wailing and, I, and I'm pulling her over, you know, to the, to the chair and, you know, Joe he talks about that song in the night. And uh, and this this praise that happens in moments where God takes from us, and you know, my mom doesn't know. Both of my parents were older. Like my dad was almost seventy when this happened, and my mom was the same was the same age, and she doesn't know anything about about Christian culture or you know popular Christian. I mean, she doesn't know our music. And that's, literally the only thing she listens to and and then my wife's music and so she doesn't know any of that and and so she it's it's the most beautiful version of this scripture in the song that I've ever heard in this song in my life there was a tone to it that I pulled her aside I'm the only one who heard this but just under her breath when she she just started to go singing this chorus, you know, for years, and um, this is just another version of it. It's really amazing story. Um, and for those of you who couldn't hear, because I know he kind of quiets down when he's saying what his mom was saying. You know, she's pounding on his chest and he pulls her away and she says he gives and he takes. Blessed be his name. That's what he was saying in, in that, that moment he got kind of quiet. If you've never heard the song, 
Take a few minutes and go and listen on YouTube and get home. Simply beautiful. It opens with these words. I want to read you the words and then we'll move into preaching. I come, God, I come. Return to the Lord. The one who's broken, the one who's torn me apart. You struck down to bind me up. You say you do it all in love. That I might know you in your suffering. And then the chorus, though you slay me, yet I will praise you. Though you take from me, I will bless your name. Though you ruin me, still I will worship. Sing a song to the one who's all I need. Anyway, I, I believe Jesus had this experience in the wilderness. That even though he was on the brink of death, he worshipped God and God alone. But I want us to ponder for a few moments together this morning how Jesus got to this place of worship. Maybe some of the things he was standing on. How was he able in a prolonged time of such agony and temptation and trial to worship God? This is what I want to look at this morning. Okay? So the big idea I'd like to try and get across is because God made us for worship, we should worship Him, even in the wilderness. Because God made us for worship, we should worship Him, even in the wilderness. And when we look at the Bible and at history and at our own experience, what we should all see is not just people, but worshipers. Everyone is engaged in worship of one kind or another. Everyone. Every single person you'll ever meet. The student who is obsessed with making perfect grades is worshiping. The parent who scrambles around constantly for their job and is never at home is worshiping. The kid who sits in front of a screen scrolling through videos and social media is worshiping. The person who spends all of their time outdoors hiking, biking, rafting is worshiping. The person who disconnects from everything and does very little in the course of the day is worshiping. Or the person who's addicted to alcohol and drugs. All, all of these people are engaged in worship of some kind or another. And everyone else. There's many other types that I didn't mention in that paragraph. You don't get to decide to worship. Everyone worships something. It's hardwired into us by our creator. A.W. Tozer says in his book, Titled Worship, these words, Man was made to worship God. God gave to man a harp and said, Here, above all the creatures that I have made and created, I have given you the largest harp. I put more strings on your instrument and I have given you a wider range than I have given to any other creature. You can worship me in a manner that no other creature can. And when he sinned, man took that instrument and threw it down in the mud. And there it has lain for centuries, rusted, broken, unstrung, and man, instead of playing a harp like the angels and seeking to worship God and all his activities, became ego-centered and turned in on himself and sulks and swears and laughs and sings. But it's all without joy and without worship. It's A.W. Tozer, end quote. Our great problem as people is not that we don't worship. It's that we worship everything. We are too loose with our worship. This is why when you read the Old Testament, God frequently calls his people whores. Because they go around and worship everything. But God made us to worship one thing. We were made for that one thing, and that one thing alone can truly satisfy our deepest longings. God. God. We were made to worship God. This is the great end of life, the point of our existence. This is why we're here. We were made for worship. And sadly, as Paul says in the first chapter of Romans, we exchange all of that, all that he is, for lesser things, and we worship and serve the creation rather than the creator. And the result 
is everything we see around us, the misery and the destruction we see all around us. Our world is so broken, not because it lacks worship, but because it's worshiping all the wrong things. So this leads us to our first major point this morning, right? So we were made for worship, big point. We were made to worship God. And point number one is this, because of God's person, or his character, we should worship him even in the wilderness. So I'm going to go for some alliteration this morning with uh, three Ps as we go through. And the first one is person. Because of God's person, we should worship him even in the wilderness. We see in our passage this morning that Jesus turns from worshiping all the wrong things and chooses to worship the one thing truly worthy of worship, God alone, God himself. We find this implicitly and explicitly in the account before us today in the Gospel of Luke. As we've seen in previous weeks, these temptations are at their core an effort to pull Jesus off of the hard road of obedience given to him by the Father. Satan invites Jesus to seek an easier way to get some of the same results. Pull him off the hard road, put him on the easy road. You can have these things this way is sort of the underlying temptation presented to Jesus. In essence, the devil says to Jesus, you want followers? Okay, well then just do this and I'll give you followers. He says, you want power? Well, just do this and I'll give you power. You want to eat and preserve your life so that you can continue on in your ministry? So you don't die of starvation here? Just do this, he says. But what this amounts to is a temptation to worship. If Jesus would have chosen to do any of those things that Satan tempted him to do, he would have been making some other thing ultimate over God. He would have been saying that these things are more worthy than God is. Whatever that thing is. The followers of the bread or comfort. My life must be oriented, he would have been saying, around these things over and above God. If he would have chosen to jump off the pinnacle of the temple and gain a massive following as people observed the angels coming to rescue him, he would have been making having followers more ultimate than God. It would have been the most important thing. In essence, saying, I know that God gave me a command to make disciples by going to the cross and dying for sin, but this way is so much easier. I'm going to do it this way. It's what Jesus would have been saying. If Jesus would have done this, he would have elevated the making of disciples to be more important than obedience to God. And whatever thing controls you and animates you is the thing you are worshiping. The thing that makes you do what you do, the thing that gets you up in the morning, the thing that you declare in your heart and mind to be most ultimate and most significant. That is what you are worshiping. And Jesus here in our passage today refused to let anything other than God determine what he did. Jesus refused to live or act in such a way that would have implied that anything was more important than God. Look at verse 8. Jesus answered him, It is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Jesus said, I serve only God. Of course, uh, we should be prompted, maybe as we do this, to think about what or who are we serving today? In other words, what thing most animates you Is it your job, money, family, pleasure, approval, reputation, fun, particular relationship? What animates you? The heartbreaking thing about all these things is that none of them is worthy of the worship we give them. We look back upon ancient cultures with all their superstitions and their gods and their idols and we think those people are so primitive and so foolish. Yet we run around in a frenzy almost constantly doing the same thing, only with different objects, don't we? We give ourselves to idols and worship all the time. They just look different. Nothing 
but God is worthy of our worship. And we see this in Jesus in his wilderness ordeal here in Luke 4. Jesus says, worship the Lord your God only. As we ponder this for a moment together, there's a massive implication that I want us to consider, and it's this. If God only or alone is worthy of our worship, then our worship should not depend upon circumstances, whether good or bad. Right? If the object of our worship is God, and not all of these other things around us, then we can worship wherever we are and whatever we are going through. Now hear me say, that doesn't mean we're always overflowing with joy and positive feelings, right? I mean, that video right there is a testimony to that. Sometimes it's excruciatingly painful and hard. But we can still worship in those moments. What we saw in that video, I think, was a moment of true and raw worship, right? Filled with pain, filled with loss, after praying for hours and hours that God would spare his life. God said, no, it's time for him to come home. And they still worshiped. They were able, in the midst of their pain, to submit to what God was doing and worship him. She honored God by acknowledging him in that painful moment. Her response to the situation was built around what she knew to be true of God. God is always good, even when things are hard. She knew that. She acknowledged who he was in the moment, his person, his character. Rather than allow her pain to dictate her response, she let God's character, God's person, who he was, determine her response. And in that moment, God had not changed. Her circumstances had changed. God had not changed. And she said, I'm going to respond in light of who God is, his character, not my circumstances. That's worship. And because God's character doesn't change, he's the same today as he was yesterday, will be forever, you can worship him, honor him as God, even in a desert, a wilderness like what he's described. And that's point number one. Our worship, we can worship even in the wilderness because of who God is, which doesn't change, it doesn't change. That's point number one. Point number two, because of God's plan, we should worship him, can worship him even in the wilderness. We've already looked at the character, person of God as a reason to worship. Now we will look at the plan of God, another P for us here. If you have your bulletin, I want you to open it up really quick. Sorry if some of you didn't get one. Open up your bulletin and look at the psalm that is printed there, Psalm 32. Three times you will find the word Selah in that psalm. There's a Selah there, that name. <laughs> if there are kids present, maybe, maybe the kids can help, help the parents find uh, some of the, the places where it says Selah in there. The scholars believe that term, you'll see it there, it's three times in this psalm. Scholars believe that term to be some kind of a musical reference of sorts, maybe like a pause, it's a liturgical, musical indicator. <coughs> maybe like a pause, but, but doesn't it strike you that psalms like this one are intended to be sung? In some cases, chanted. Some of the psalms are like chants. I mean, it's in the psalm book, right? And they kind of default the name of the book, and they okay, this is a a book of songs. But when you look at the content, isn't it interesting sometimes the kinds of things that we're chanting or saying to the Lord? Isn't it fascinating? It's especially interesting, again, we look at, if you are familiar with the Psalter and you go through, you see that many of the songs are laments. There are intense grief and turmoil, agony is happening, pain, fear, despair. And they're singing. They're lifting their voices Sometimes even in the assembly, together, reciting these themes, you know. My enemies are coming, my enemies, I'm being silly, but they're saying things, right, that are, that are uh, scary and fearful, and they're chanting them, singing them to God. That wasn't a very helpful uh, way of, of uh, illustrating that, but you get what I'm trying to say, right? They're chanting, singing to the Lord, 
even in great uh, desperation, anguish, anger, frustration. But you will often find in these psalms, not all of them, but in most of them, you will find mingled in declarations of hope and confidence in God. Hope and confidence in God. There's a sense in most of the psalms that God will work things out for the best. There is a trust in His plan, even when they're in exile, even when the enemies are coming down on them, or, or, or like, again, in that case of David, Psalm 63, which we read a few weeks ago. David's in the wilderness. He's being pursued by an enemy, and he's worshiping. Because he has a sense that it's going to work out. Somehow, God has a plan, and it's a good one. And we find that here in our passage today in Luke 4. For a moment, I want us to to look quickly at verses 1 and 2 from this passage again. And Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by the devil. And he ate nothing during those 40 days, and when they were ended, he was hungry. Now I want to point out two quick things as it pertains to this idea of God's plan uh, really quickly. Two things to make uh, this second point. The first one is this. Notice in verse 2 the phrase being tempted. You see that there in verse 2. Your translation may have was tempted or something like that, making it sound more past tense, completed kind of action. But being tempted is what you'll find in more of the uh, literal translations. Um, and it actually reflects, I think, the original Greek a little better. Uh, because the original Greek is a present participle. It's an ongoing action. It's an ing word, being tempted. And that is significant because it seems to suggest that Jesus has been tempted, is being tempted throughout the 40 days in the wilderness. It's not like he's been in the wilderness, he's fasting, and then right here at the end, the devil shows up and confronts him with all these temptations. Here in Luke, it reads more like he's actively being tempted throughout this time in the wilderness. Again, perhaps the temptations we have recorded here in this section were the climatic or final greatest temptations or something. We don't know. But they certainly were not the only temptations that Jesus faced. And why is this worth pointing out? Why am I pointing this out? Well, it's, it's worth pointing out, I think, because it reveals to us that Jesus, while he's being tempted all 40 days in the wilderness, does not lose sight of the plan of God throughout the trial. He's, he's got his, some kind of an understanding that there's a purpose in this, and that, I think, sustains him and gives him hope and confidence uh, throughout at the trial. After the 40 days of temptation, he's still resolute and unwavering in his worship of God alone, his res resistance of the devil. Jesus here is full of trust. There's no sense of panic or worry Jesus fully trusts that God has him right where he is for good reasons, even to the point where he's willing to die to be obedient. I will starve to death before I do something against what my Father has commanded me. It was no mystery to Jesus where all this was headed. He knew that the road he was on would lead to the cross, and throughout his ministry, he tells his disciples he's going to be killed. He says this repeatedly to them. It would be quite a temptation, I think, for us, certainly, right? To, to just want to escape that. Jesus does not. So here in the wilderness, the devil trying to give him an easy way out, Jesus doesn't take it, even knowing that he was, he was headed to the cross at some point in his Ministry, a violent and bloody death was where this was going. Jesus knew that, and he knew that wherever, whatever was happening to him, even if it was evil and wrong and unjust, that God would and could work it out for good. Again, we get no impression at all here that Jesus is worried. He's perfectly happy to be in the hand of God, even when in a very difficult position. Jesus trusted in the plan of God. Now, I will never forget that day that I was informed. I was informed by Duke Energy, one of the largest energy companies on the planet, I believe, 
that I did not get the job I applied for as an operator at a nuclear power plant in the Charlotte area. This is what I was wanting to do after I had lost my job. Me and Megan had been married at that point, maybe just four or five months, and I got laid off from the company I was with for six years. And then shortly after that, we were pregnant. So no job, no direction, pregnant, newlywed. You know, you can throw a few more trials in there, but you know, right? it was a time of, of great turmoil for us. We weren't sure where this was going. I really believed I was going to get this position. My uncle worked at this power plant for nearly 40 years. He was well respected, and lots of times to get a job like this, you kind of need an in. I had a big in. Um, I was qualified for the position. I did not get it. And I had waited on this application, went through the whole interview process, and waited some time uh, for this, and I did not get the job. And i uh, been unemployed for months at that point. Again, this is 2008, 2009. The housing bubble had just popped. Everyone was you know, wondering where this was all going. And I just remember wondering, like probably millions of other people during that time, what are you doing? What is going on here? I didn't get married and do all of these things to end up in this position. Like, where, like this isn't according to my plan, God. <laughs> right? I had a different plan. What are you doing? Well, eventually the Lord moved me to go to seminary and began my studies to be a minister of the gospel, which of course eventually led me here. I mention this because ever since becoming a Christian, I had dreamed about full-time ministry. And God confirmed that calling numerous times, but I would have never went about it that way. Who would, right? And the truth is, what I've come to realize is that I would have never done it at all had God not put me into that position. Unemployed, no money, no direction, no they would have someone at my side. I would have never taken that step. God knew that. God knew that. God led me into a wilderness experience to lead me into something new, to a place he wanted me to be. And I see that now, in hindsight. It's a lesson in trust. Trust the plan of God, right? Trust God's plan. Jesus was doing that in the wilderness. And he calls us to do that too. The second thing you see here under the second point, again looking at verse 1, is that the Spirit of God led Jesus into the wilderness. Now we took a whole Sunday a few weeks ago and looked at this verse. Um, so ju just a quick you know, and simple point of application here for you. I'm not going to run all through uh, you know, everything I said um, a few weeks ago again. But Jesus, at this point, was physically alone himself um, at this moment for for these 40 days in the wilderness, Jesus was by himself. And uh, it, maybe, perhaps, he took little respites to go into town. We don't know, but it appears from what we have in the text that, uh, that Jesus was alone in the wilderness by himself for 40 days. And if you go back and look at the life of Christ, you will find that Jesus often sought out solitude or a desolate place where he could be alone, especially before he made significant life decisions, or ministry decisions. Jesus sought solitude, and so should we. Sometimes we are so confused about what God wants us to do because we're never alone with God. We're either with someone or got noise in the background, the TV going, radio going, music going, have our phone out looking at it, scrolling through Facebook, or we're just running errands, or we're busy, 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 busy. We're so distracted. It's no wonder so many of us cannot discern the Lord's will because we're never alone with Him. That's a point I've made already in this series, but I wanted to draw it out again for us here because it's so vital to our Christian life. When you think about the plan of God, what God is doing, and trusting in that plan, when you read this account, we see that Jesus is filled with trust. We get this sense. He's trusting God. He's turning from these temptations because he knows God has a good plan and he trusts that plan because he trusts in God. He knows God is good and is working all things together for good. And remember, this is not some rosy, cozy plan. This is a hard plan. A hard road, but he trusts in his Father. 
Sometimes you are going to face something really, really hard. Many of you are right now. A number of you are in the middle of something really incredibly difficult. If you can remove yourself from the distractions of everyday life and get along alone with the Lord on a regular basis, you will be in a better position to not only see what God is doing, but receive it and accept it. And accepting what God is doing is an act of worship. It's an act of worship. It's an act of submission, and that's hard. Of saying to God, God, you're in charge. I trust you. I don't know where this is going exactly. I don't get the details, but I trust you. That is worship. That's worship. Because of God's plan, because we can trust his plan and his person, we can and should worship him even in the wilderness. That's point number two. Now let's look at our final point. Because of God's pursuit, we should worship him even in the wilderness. Again, I'm trying for some alliteration this morning with the three Ps. Person, plan, pursuit. We've looked at the person of God, the plan of God. Now we'll take a moment to see the pursuit of God. And now I remember a summer, summer day, so I'm filled with stories about my life and my family this morning. You know, bear with me in that. I wouldn't use some of you as examples, but you might not like that. <laughs> I use myself as an example, right? I remember a summer day, not long after moving to South Royalton, um, when I would know a kind of fear that I've never felt before, and I think I've shared this story with some of you before, kind of as a funny point, because it is kind of funny, um, even though for me, in the moment, it was very fearful. I was in my yard working on a chicken coop, and I was on kid duty while Megan was occupied with some other things, and I hate it at the time, our oldest was going to South Royalton School, it was down at the school, so we were in the rhythm of dropping off and picking up and all of that good stuff. Um, now, I told Emmaus and Emma, Hermione was really little at this point in time, that Daddy would be out working on chicken coop, stay in the yard, I said, stay in the yard. Well, sometime later, I noticed that all of a sudden it had gotten extremely quiet, too quiet. I came up the hill, I was actually working, our house has a, 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 like a hill behind it, and I was kind of down over the hill, working on a fence, an enclosure. And uh, I came up after thinking, man, it's really quiet. And uh, kids, nowhere to be found. Nowhere to be found. Um, for about five minutes, I was feeling a kind of fear that I'd never felt before. This happened to us at the Tunbridge Fair another time. I think I've shared that again with some of you. For about five minutes, I was like, whoa, um, what's going on? I spent the next few minutes tearing through the house, searching for them. I went down to the... Uh, Pediatric clinic, maybe this is all public, so I hope I don't get you know, <laughs> DSF or whatever uh, on me here for this kind of stuff. Um, I went down to the pediatric clinic, and I'm looking around, right, I'm trying to figure out where the kids, you know, they, okay, where do they know? Maybe they came to the church, maybe they went to a neighbor, and I'm, I'm doing all that stuff. And at that moment, I realized they went, like, they're lost. Like, I don't know where my kids are, you know, at that point. Um, and just a few minutes later, I got a phone call from someone at the school saying, I've got two young kids down here that I think are yours, and uh, would you like to come and get them? Uh, and of course we went down to get them, um, and to scold them a little bit, you know, <laughs> and embrace them, of course. We were so happy to, to see them. A father and mother in that position, my point is, won't stop pursuing until they find their precious children, right? You lose your kids, something happens. If you're a parent, a grandparent, you've probably been in that position at least for a brief moment here or there uh, in your life. But you won't stop looking until you find your children. Parents long to be with them and for them to be safe. And so God longs to be with his children too. That desire of parents to care for their kids, to protect them, to be with them, comes from God. That's a God-given, innate image of God thing that we have. Those of you who are reading the book 
Rediscover Church. I encourage you, if you haven't gotten a copy already, I think there's still a couple back there. You can, you can uh, grab one for free. And those who have been reading through that book will know just how significant this point is. In fact, the authors rightly say that one of the most significant displays of God's desire to be with his people is the incarnation. That is, the coming down out of heaven of the Son of God to dwell with his people. God wanted to be with his people so greatly, he came down to be with them. He pursued us in this wilderness of the world. This mess of the world came down. Now, if you know anything about the biblical story, you'll remember back in the garden, the grief that would have been in the heart of God to have to kick his children out of the garden, right? After they sinned in the very beginning, he had to remove them, boot them out of his presence. The Bible says that God walked in the cool of the evening with Adam and Eve. He, he was with them in their very presence. They were in his very presence. It was a 100% of the time loving kind of relationship. And you could say that the garden was the first temple, the first sacred space. And Adam, you could argue, was the first worship leader. And he was given this task to oversee the creation and steward all of it as an act of worship. But then he failed along with Eve, and they chose to worship and serve the creation over him. And he had to respond because he's righteous and just and good by barring them from the garden. They could no longer be in his presence. They could no longer be with him. So out they went. But this was just the beginning of the story. And in barring Adam and Eve from the garden and from his presence, he was actually preserving their life. It's an act of preservation. If you're a sinful person, you cannot be in the presence of the Holy God. God was protecting you. He was saying, I can no longer be with you because of your sin, but I will pursue you. I will come again for you. And for mankind, ever since that time, life has not been an experience walking through a lush garden. It has been a wilderness. A wilderness of war and famine, death and destruction. In our lives today, our world today, the testimony to that. But in that wilderness, God is still pursuing his people. We see throughout the rest of Scripture a God who is constantly pursuing his people, pursuing their hearts, desiring for relationship and seek, seeking to restore what was broken. The coming of Jesus into the world was an act of pursuit as well. So in Christ he came down to us that we might know him face to face as Adam and Eve knew him in the garden. And in Christ, he came into the wilderness with us. There was no way for us to get back to the garden to fix what we had broken, so he came to us and did what we could not do. And we see this in this account before us today, a God willing to be tested, to be tried, and to suffer, to make a way for you and for me to be drawn back into the very presence of God and to do what we were made to do. What was that? <coughs> worship, right? We were made to worship. The wilderness can be a place of worship, but first, you must see the Lord pursuing you there. Whatever you're facing right now, God is pursuing your heart. God is after your heart. As an act of worship, I want to invite you to think about this. Maybe you close your eyes, whatever's helpful for you. As an act of worship, instead of just asking God to remove whatever the struggle or the difficulty is in your life, in thinking about the video here, right? To just heal dad, to heal my husband, my wife, or instead of praying that way, not saying those are wrong prayers or bad prayers, but as an act of worship, instead of just praying that way, to think about how God might be pursuing your heart in the struggle. How is God pursuing you in that struggle? Ask yourself this question. What is God doing in that wilderness, in that desert, that place of trial and testing? Instead of seeking to control the situation or change it or just have it done away with or removed, think about how God is pursuing you. 
How is God pursuing you in that? And when you can trust God's person, that is his character, trust his plan, and know that he is pursuing you, his child, always in love, you will be able to worship no matter the wilderness you're in. Again, like that wife in the video we watched at the beginning, you can say, even in your trial, he gives and he takes. Blessed is the name of the Lord. I invite you now to worship the Lord wherever you are, whatever you're going through with these things in mind. He is worthy of your worship. Amen. Let's turn to him in prayer now as we transition into um, a closing song. I want to pray for us. God, we pray, oh Lord, we come to you in the wilderness of this life, this existence, which is a gift and is a blessing in so many ways, but Lord, is so fraught with trial and fear and difficulty. We come to you in the midst of our own little wilderness experiences, whatever they might be. And Lord, we open our hands to you and we say, we trust you, God. We trust your person, who you are, your character. We trust your plan. You have a good plan and purpose for us and for this creation. And we know that in these things, you are pursuing our hearts. So we open our hands to you and we worship you. We love you. We thank you for Jesus who did all of these things in the wilderness and we see that in our passage today. Oh Lord, may we be filled up with your spirit, spirit of Christ, that we might too trust you in every way. And it's in Jesus' name.